Hello, and welcome to this series of talks accompanying our exhibition, Making a Mark, now on at the Barber Institute of Fine Arts. My name's Sam, and in this talk, I'll explore the role that drawing had in both depicting and itself becoming an integral part of business and everyday life in the Low Countries in the 17th century. And in doing so, I will touch upon the legacy of colonialism within Dutch and Flemish drawings. At the dawn of the 17th century, the Dutch Republic, also known as the United Provinces, was a relatively new state, having broken free from Spanish Habsburg rule as recently as 1588. At that time, the United Provinces was a small state with around 1.5 million inhabitants. If it was to establish itself as a global force, the Republic had to look outward to develop its fledgling economy. Greater freedoms for Dutch citizens enabled the arts and sciences to flourish, but a boom in global corporate enterprises at the turn of the century enabled Dutch fleets to begin dominating trade routes all over the world. The conflicts that arose from this imperial expansion evidenced the Dutch Republic's emerging status on the international stage, a status it sought to reinforce through mapmaking. Mapmaking or cartography became a key process of imperial justification during this period. As both a science and an art, Maps could chart the exploration of a supposed new world in a way that promoted and endorsed the Dutch Republic's exploits abroad. For the state, maps could act as propaganda to prospective settlers and investors and legitimise their violent conquest. Meanwhile, maps also served as proof, visual documentation of commercial and military success for the Dutch audience at home. National identity could be asserted in geographical print and then sold to the middle classes en masse. An expanding middle class sought to satisfy their aspirational impulse for luxury goods with the fruits of imperial expansion. While the Dutch West India Company was busy ensuring the global domination of trade, Dutch audiences increasingly demanded what were considered to be exotic goods. This process of map making positioned the artist as a key component in the formulation of national self-identity. Amsterdam became a centre for cartographic production and there was stiff competition in the field. The artist was recruited to give the mapmakers and publishers a competitive edge, bringing maps to life and illustrating the new world for the armchair traveller. Those at home who had neither the time nor the money to join in on imperial exploits. At the same time, the artist would become a vital asset in fostering and fueling a compulsive collecting culture. Alongside maps, wealthy individuals sought exotic objects from all over the world. This drawing, by Franz Franken the Younger, depicts a self-aware group of wealthy male collectors discussing the painting between them. Next to this group, on the table, sits a globe surrounded by unidentifiable scientific instruments and writing materials. Beyond this group, the eye is led unto a vast hall filled with works of fine art. Paintings of all shapes and sizes adorn every inch of wall space and rise as high as the composition of fords, if not beyond. While Franken looks to have scribbled ambiguous forms within an eclectic range of frames, upon closer inspection we can begin to make out subject matter, landscapes, figures, flowers and sculpted forms. While a grand gallery such as this could only have belonged to the aristocracy, Collecting art objects, scientific instruments and even drawings became a fervent passion for an emerging merchant class in the Netherlands during the 17th century. Intellectual wealth and social standing could be cultivated and displayed for all to see. High society status could now be purchased and any aspiring individual worth their salt simply had to acquire things. These galleries, alongside smaller rooms laden with rare objects known as cabinets of curiosities, were the precursor to the modern museum collection. Natural history was a particular focus for aspiring collectors, and these studies of a European otter, a highlight from the Barber's own collection, demonstrate the increased impulse for observation and scientific documentation. This luxuriant impulse for the unusual meant that the Dutch imperial expansion into the so-called New World offered collectors a supposed exoticism. This exoticism added material value in the form of rarity and maps were an increasingly popular, commonly available product to display such. This drawing is a design by Nicholas Bircham 
for a popular printed atlas published by renowned mapmaker Nicholas Vischer the Elder. Designed and decorated for a mass audience, maps of colonised territories could capitalise on the double allure of both exoticism and nationalist pride. Brazil was a particularly crucial political subject for a domestic audience, as the Dutch displaced the Portuguese as colonial masters from 1630 until 1654. This cemented Dutch authority in South America, which was previously dominated by the Spanish Empire, and enabled them to control the Atlantic slave trade. Through maps, Dutch colonial violence could be justified and glorified in their eyes. In this drawing, for example, the allegory of the Americas is made up of imagined depictions of indigenous people. The central figure stands and points to a depiction of heathen or non-Christian worship before a temple of idols, while gold bars lay at their feet. This imagery alludes to the popular justification for imperial expansion, that a colony's natural resources were a payment of sorts for the colonizer's gift of Christianity, seen as a rescue from the worship of perceived false idols. While the desire for exotic collectibles led some wealthier citizens to the Americas, most publishers found it far easier and cheaper to employ artists who would simply copy from previous publications. The commercial success of Vicious Atlases meant that representations formulated by the artist's imagination, such as this, would prove highly influential in constructing subsequent images of indigenous people. Through looking closely at drawings and questioning their cultural and economic significance, wider narratives concerning politics, class, colonialism and violence start to emerge. The dominance of Dutch Atlantic trade during this period ensured the shipment of tens of thousands of enslaved people from West Africa to sugar plantations in South America and the Caribbean. It is through the artist's hand in particular that we may begin to witness more comprehensively the commercial and evangelical role that art and collecting had in these colonial histories. So armed with questions such as, what was this for? Who was it for? And where does the money lead? your visit to Making a Mark might just begin to unfold in ways you might not have expected. To discover more, please visit the Barber website to delve deeper. Or even better, come along to the Barber Institute and see for yourself if you can.